I think those were Dylan's born again years. I'm not sure. Uh, please uh, join me in the call to worship found in your bulletin. Creator of the world, eternal God, for many places for a little while. Redeemer of humanity, God with us, come with all our differences, seeking common ground. Spirit of unity, go between God. We come on journeys of our own to hear where journeys meet. So in this shelter house, let us take time together, for when paths cross and pilgrims gather, there's much to celebrate. Please stand and join in singing the community song. Let us pray. Dear God of the universe, greater and much closer than we can comprehend, we are, all of us, so tangled up in blue in one way or another as a result of these simple twists of fate in our life, or were they choices that we made along the way? And so we come this morning for a shelter from the storm as buckets on buckets of rain fall right outside the door, both literally and metaphorically, God. We draw in close, grabbing for your leg to hold, because we fear we're going to be made lonesome, and maybe you'll go. But you've said you're always near, nearer than we might ever know or imagine. May you meet us this morning like a rising sun, Amen. Amen. A few brief thoughts on the way, which is a time of teaching. Um, if you were to ask me what it is you can do in your life that would have the greatest spiritual impact, if you were looking for some change or some transformation, you were hoping to grow spiritually and kind of get that part of your life together, I'd have one word for you. And it would be pray. There's value in reading scripture. There's value in coming to church. But top of the list, I think, is prayer. Now, Jesus didn't talk a huge amount about prayer when he was teaching during his span of 36 months of ministry. But he said three primary things. First, he offered the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer wasn't Jesus only way of saying, oh, this is how everyone should pray, or you should pray this every day. What he was doing was offering an example. Here's an example that sort of covered the key bases of life. We'll share it together in a few minutes after the joys and concerns. The second thing Jesus talks about praying is he said, when you pray, go into your room, and the Greek says literally, Lock the door behind you and pray alone before your Father who is in heaven. Now, in terms of the context, what Jesus was addressing were the people in his faith, the Hebrew faith, that when they were called to pray at certain times during the day, they quick go to the place where everyone was, where people could see them. Oh, here's a church filled with people. Gong, it's time to pray. 
And then they'd pray in a way and in a place and with a volume so that everyone would see them praying and know how devout they are. And what Jesus is saying is, you know what? That doesn't matter. Don't, don't worry about other people seeing you pray. That's not what it's about. In fact, God already knows what your prayers are even before you say them. So just go into your room and be still and pray before God there. The third thing that Jesus said about praying is pray without ceasing. Now that doesn't mean become like a monk and devote your life to nonstop prayer. What it means, at least as I understand it, and based on the context 2,000 years ago, is that Jesus was saying, let your conversation with God during the course of the day be ongoing. So Zach and I might be seated up here, and I have a quick thought. God, thank you for all the people who came out on a funky, rainy, chilly morning. Or I'll see someone walk through the door who I know is, has a life filled with struggles right now, and I'll simply say, Lord, be with them. That's praying without ceasing. You don't even have to mouth the words. You might simply think it. But that's a way of sharing what's going on in your life with God every minute of the day. And living life, as we say, in the light of God's love. So if you are looking for some transformation in your life spiritually, I challenge you to pick just one of those two. Give it a try. Close the door. Pray before God who is in heaven. Or try praying without ceasing. We're praying for that baby right now, aren't we? <laughs> and the parents. <laughs> Give it a try. To be perfectly honest, what I am not so good at is closing the door and praying without ceasing. It's just how I'm wired. Hard to slow down. My mind's like, Rrr. and as soon as I say something in a prayer with my eyes closed, I'm going, oh, that was a pretty good line. I'll open my eyes and say, oh, I'll use that in church on Sunday. I don't do that very well. But you know what? I'm okay at praying without ceasing. If you want to transform your spiritual life, your faith, give one of those two a try. Amen. So we've got a classic Bob Dylan song, I Shall Be Released, uh, that we are going to sing uh, responsively, and we'll do the verses, and then we ask you, if you are able, to stand and join together in the congregational refrain, which is, I see my light come shining from the west unto the east, any day now, any day now, I shall be released. Please stand. Say that everything can be replaced. Every distance. 
Okay, you guys are good. What is worth noting is that uh, this group of human beings uh, playing music this morning, all of them together as one uh, band, uh, has only played once before, which was a, a rehearsal at Ken's house uh, this past week, and I think they do an extraordinary job. Um, <clears throat> A couple other things to mention, uh, because of the uh, capital campaign and some wonderful uh, donations, uh, all our services now uh, are online. So if on Tuesday, usually by uh, Tuesday, uh, Elliot's something Elliot's in charge of, by midday, uh, the entire service, with the exception of uh, our welcome and uh, when you all say hello to each other, and also joys and concerns. We don't have that uh, online but you can uh, uh, listen to the music and the entire service again, or you can make a friend aware of it uh, by simply going to uh, our website. And uh, so that's a, a new ministry we have. Uh, we have been blessed with uh, uh, a number of visitors during the, especially the last six months, or folks who are new to our church. And as you may know, we don't have members per se. We don't uh, say, well, if you want to be part of us, First, you have to say this is what you believe, and second, you have to sign on the dotted line, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We just want our doors to be uh, wide open, and if it uh, fits for you and feeds you, uh, then come back. Uh, it's, it's really that simple. But if you'd like to know more about our church, uh, we also don't have any formal uh, programs. We don't say, well, on the second Thursday of every other month, you know, come see us and we'll have a program telling you about us. If you'd like to know more about our church, uh, simply give Zach or me or both of us a call. Um, we're far more about relationships in this church uh, than we are programs, though we have plenty of programs. Uh, we wanna get to know you, we wanna get to know your name. And so if you have questions about our church, our ministry, what this is all about, just give us a call and let's have a, a cup of coffee or tea. And uh, Enough said. So the scripture uh, is very brief. It comes from the book, the letter that Martin Luther said is the epistle of straw and has no place in the Bible. And it's the epistle of James. And what frustrated Martin Luther about it is that what James said is, you know, it's not just enough to have faith. You have to get out of your pew. You have to get off your duff and you have to do something. It's also about works. And so two lines from James chapter one, but be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For religion that is pure and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. 
once in a while, uh, just as a prelude, one more prelude, uh, once in a while, uh, you write a sermon, and during the course of the week, you, you think that that looks pretty good or sounds pretty good, and then you go to the office Saturday morning, and normally God doesn't speak loudly and clearly to me, but yesterday morning, uh, God spoke loudly and clearly and said, Tom, <laughs> what are you thinking? You can't preach that. Uh, not because it was uh, uh, inappropriate, but because it didn't make any sense, and I think it was really kind of boring. And so uh, started fresh uh, yesterday, and so this, uh, forgive me, is kind of the unfinished uh, uh, sermon, and uh, amidst the uh, smorgasbord of tidbits, I hope you find a meal. Uh, let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for, Lord, you are the rock of our lives, and you are our Redeemer. Amen. So this morning I began with a story I actually told a number of years ago. And I think it's perfect for the second Sunday of Eastertide, and it's about a little boy who loves trees. There once was a little boy who loved trees, and he lived on a small farm in the midst of a great forest. Every day, just before the sun would set, he would go out to the edge of the forest into a clearing. And there he'd walk around and he would admire the great oaks and pines with a sense of awe and wonder. One day he noticed that there was a small sapling just a little bit taller than he was. It was struggling towards the light. He could tell of that tree's great struggle because it was starting to grow at an angle. And so he went back to the barn. He got a shovel. He dug up that tree, and he took it from underneath the canopy of the forest and planted it at the edge of the clearing in a place where, he could, where the tree could both get sunlight as well as he could see it in the distance from his bedroom window. He fashioned some straight poles from the branches of a very generous pine tree, placing one on either side of this sapling. And then he took some rope and tied it together. So that tree pointed straight up towards the sun that it had so earnestly sought all the days of its life. And every day the boy would bring a bucket of water from the house and he would put it in the ground to feed that tree. Well, of course, as the boy grew, he became very, very attached to the tree. And what he did not know was that his activities didn't escape the notice of his father, who would sometimes come out when the boy was at school and spread a little fertilizer on the tree. And periodically, he'd examine it for infestation and spray it if needed. You see, the father knew that learning to care for something was a powerful, powerful character builder and much easier having his child care for a tree than something like housebreaking a puppy. <laughs> so one day the boy went out after school to water his tree and to his horror, he found it broken snapped in two, lying in the dirt. He looked around on the ground around it and found evidence that a large bear had rolled over his tree. The boy with a broken heart, a lump in his throat and tears in his eyes, took what remained of the tree and carried it to his father. His dad was amazing. He had confidence that his dad could fix anything. Maybe, maybe he could fix that tree too. When his father received the tree, he listened carefully to his son's story about how he had raised the tree from a tiny little sapling. He told his son that he would do what he could and that the son should go do his chores and then late this afternoon come back to his workshop. 
The boy was tormented all day by expectation. Oh, how he hoped his dad could bring that tree back to life. A task that normally took a few moments seemed to take hours. When the day was done, the little boy went back to his father and walked into his workshop and said expectantly, Dad, Dad, is the tree going to be okay? The father, also with a broken heart, looked down at his son and said that it was too late to save the tree. The damage was too great. And that little boy began to cry. His father gently placed his large calloused hand on his son's shoulder and gave him a hug. And he said, Son, your tree is not gone. Come with me to the shop. And the father led his still weeping son to the shop and pointed to the workbench where he said, There is your tree. The young boy looked in wonder. That's my tree? Yes, said the father. The little boy's sorrow turned to joy as he beheld a small train that the father had carved from the tree. An engine, two boxcars, a tiny little caboose. The father had transformed tragedy into triumph. That's the Easter story, isn't it? Resurrection, new life, tragedy into triumph. From the uncertainness and darkness of night, uncertainty and darkness of night, to the dawn and bright hope of a new day. Now, I know many of you well enough to know that as soon as I mention the resurrection, you fidget just a little bit. Uncertain about this miraculous transformation from death to new life that in churches we talk about once per year. If there were a continuum on the resurrection from 1 to 10, with 1 being absolutely, I believe in it, beyond a shadow of a doubt, to 5, yeah, I'm not sure, to 10, no, nah, I don't buy it. Right now, there are people within these four walls that would fit everywhere from 1 until 10. The question is, where do you fit? With that in mind, knowing that we have ones and tens and everything in between, let me share a recent story, and in the spirit of a tree, I probably go out on a limb a little bit in what I'm going to say. But I hope and think it's germane. Here's a way to think about Easter transformation that's absolutely true, but also goes beyond resurrection. This past week, I had the joy of spending a long lunch with one of the most important people in my life, my mentor, my surrogate father, my spiritual father, built for 40-plus years. His name is Bill Enright. He was my minister and a kid as a kid, and he has been ever since. Bill grew up in an evangelical household, but as he began his ministry, he became more of a centrist. I grew up in kind of a center, mainline denominational church. He was the minister. But over the years, I probably moved a little bit into a more progressive, open-minded place. What that means is that Bill and I are a little bit different in terms of how we think about things theologically. And frankly, when we talk, which is often, sometimes it's hard for me to be completely honest and open with my spiritual father because I think about things differently than he, and I have all the respect in the world for him. So it's a little bit awkward, but at this three-hour lunch this past Wednesday down in Indianapolis, our conversation evolved 
in a way that I quite naturally and for some reason without any hesitation shared with Bill where I was on faith and on the Easter event we celebrated two weeks ago this morning. I said, Bill, at this stage of my life, I have little question in my mind. In fact, more faith than ever that there is some kind of spiritual realm beyond life on this earth. I have absolutely no idea what form it takes. I'm just quite confident, in fact, absolutely confident that there's something. But you know what? During the 52 weeks in the year that I preach, or the 40-some weeks that I preach at our church, I seldom preach on the resurrection or heaven. And I don't spend a lot of time in my personal faith thinking about it. And here's the reason. It's because it's out of my hands. It's out of our hands. If there is this divine realm after life on this earth, the truth of the matter is this. The only hope I have for that, the only hope any of us has, is God's grace. That's the only thing that's going to make it happen. So I feel like my job, while I am blessed with the gift of life, is not to focus on the next life, but to instead focus on this life right here, right now. Bill paused for a moment after my mini-sermon. He looked at me with this way that he has one eyebrow up and one down and with this deep pastor's voice of a guy in his 80s who's still six foot five. He said, that's good theology, Tommy. <laughs> still calls me Tommy. I don't know if it's good theology or not. So I don't spend a lot of time focusing on what is out of my control, whether it has to do with life beyond this life or everyday living. I don't spend a lot of time thinking about the weather because there's not a thing in the world that we can do about a rainy, funky day like this. So while I don't spend a lot of time thinking about the resurrection, and it is not the story upon which my faith and ministry hinges. Don't believe for one second that I don't have an Easter faith that says powerful transformation still occurs in our lives right here and right now. And faith in following the way of Jesus absolutely can bring to us after dark nights and in those dark places in our lives we can experience the dawn of a new day and here's how we go from tragedy to triumph in this life sometimes miracles happen no question in my mind. Sometimes miracles happen. Now, to be honest, my success rate in praying for miracles is pretty slim. I'm sure of all the prayers that I have offered for you and people I have served as a minister and folks I love, um, you know, probably less than 1%. Like that boy praying that his father would somehow fix that broken tree, you know what, it didn't happen. Most of the miracles I pray for, healings and the like, they don't happen. Dramatic miracles like going from death to life or blind people suddenly being able to see, they occur about as often as I catch a muskie or find a floor leaf clover, not real often. Do they occur 
Yes. Do I understand why sometimes miracles occur and sometimes they don't? Absolutely not. But I still pray for them. I still pray for you. I'll pray for healing. Zach will too, without any hesitation, with our joys and concerns, because we're supposed to share what's going on in our lives and in our hearts with God. And then with faith, say, God, this is in your hands. And so we still pray for miracles, and sometimes they do a cure. And sometimes transformation occurs through prayer. One of these Sundays down at the beach, I'm going to talk about prayer. And I'm sure I'll tell you the stories that I can't begin to understand. Medical studies that have been replicated multiple times that say if you've had surgery and there's a group of people praying for you, and it doesn't matter whether you know they're praying for you or not, or even what tradition they come from. You will have, as one being prayed for, a lower mortality rate, a shorter recovery time, and a lessened need for medication. How does that work? I don't begin to know. I can't explain it. But it's been documented time and time and time again. Sometimes on this earth, prayer changes things beyond a shadow of a doubt. But here's the other way that we're transformed in this life. When we pray, prayer doesn't always change things, but it always changes us. Prayer doesn't always change things, but it does change us. Finally, here's how God's transformation also occurs on this earth. And it's when we listen to the words of James, who says, be doers of the word. And we dare to listen to God's song and let our lives become a dance of love and service. We become transformed in following the way of Jesus because it's all about the other. The reality is we live in a world, most of us, that's kind of all about us. What can I do for me? What can I get for myself? How can I be happy? It's all about I. It's all about me. And if you seek transformation, Transformation in your life. Get away from yourself and look at the universe outside of you and find a way to serve. How about going up to Beacon Place? A young Hispanic child, because of people in this congregation and other churches, gets help learning how to read. That's transformative for both. Kids Uganda, there are little girls who could sleep safely, nine and ten years old, without moms, without dads, who had a safe place to sleep last night because of all of you and because of Kids Uganda. That transforms their life. It transforms ours as well. What about Buffalo Babies? What a silly name, our new program here at the church. Whenever there's a baby born in our congregation or connected to our congregation, we put out a little jar in the front and the back and people put in a couple bucks. We hope to raise at each one $147. What do we do? We buy a Buffalo bicycle, a robust bike manufactured by design in Africa. And then that bike is given to someone like a health care worker who used to be on foot serving people. And if he or she has a bicycle, which we give them, soon the number of people that they can serve increases by a factor of five. That's how our lives, other people's lives, 
are transformed right here, right now. What about two months from just a few days ago when because of some of you and your vision, we have this new thing that we're calling net gain. And 14 young men from Chicago's nastiest ghetto who are part of a basketball team at Orr High School that won the state championship are going to get out of that ghetto for one day and come up and be with us and break bread with us and have a basketball game with us so that we can raise a few bucks to help buy them basketballs and uniforms so this great coach, Lou Adams, can keep that program going. That's going to transform those young men. The coach has said, I have boys on this basketball team who have lived their entire lives in Chicago, 16 years old. They've never seen the lakefront. Never moved from Austin down to Lake Michigan's shores. Well, they're going to come up and see the lake and a lot more. Hopefully that will be transformative for them and for all of us. Transformation. God's transformation absolutely takes place in this world right here, right now, and it happens when we become doers of the word. A final question. Think about the most meaningful moment in your life or the most meaningful moments in your life I bet you, and when we're shaking hands, tell me if I'm wrong. But I bet you almost without exception, it was about caring for and serving and loving someone else. When we do that, that's being someone who is a doer of the word. And that transforms our world. It transforms you and me as well. Amen.
Nicely done. Thank you. <clears throat> this past week, the reason I was in Indianapolis for a day and a half was I was attending a, a meeting of uh, eight churches in the United States that uh, had been chosen as uh, the kind of most innovative and unique churches uh, in the country, and a couple people writing a book about that. And so there was one church that targeted, and this is their language, uh, in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, the queer community and serves them. There's another church that focuses on people who are foodies, and every Thursday night their worship and get-together always revolves around dinner. There's a church in Seattle led by a very likable, tall, long-haired, kind of hippie guy with a ponytail, and their service to the world revolves around civil disobedience. And on the Monday after Palm Sunday, they have Table Turning Monday, where they go out and whoever they're most ticked at, uh, they call the TV stations and they have a big protest. If you can imagine this, we were the most and I was the most conservative person in this entire group. <laughs> My point is this. Look at your life. Listen to your heart. There is someone, there is something that needs you. In the words of Bob Dylan, you got to serve somebody. Go out and do it. And may grace, mercy, and peace be with you this day and every day. And the people said, Amen. Thank you.